muslimske og ikke-muslimske forskere, som er med til at udbrede de nye forestillinger og fortællinger om, om islam, som kan være med til at rokke ved det billede, vi har af islam i Vesten, som ikke er særlig positivt. Vi hører ofte de her myter omkring, at islam og muslimer ikke har bidraget med noget væsentligt til vestlig civilisation og udvikling, og det billede vil vi gerne udfordre, og derfor har vi inviteret dig, Christian. Christian Høgel er forsker ved Syddansk Universitet. Han har arbejdet med både græsk og arabisk litteratur. Han har også arbejdet med en tidlig græsk oversættelse af Koranen fra det 9. århundrede. Og i dag skal han introducere og tale og forelæse over i den tufans, Hey Ibn Yaksan. Og jeg vil gerne byde dig hjertelig velkommen. Tusind tak. Ja. Jamen, tusind tak, og øh, tak for invitationen til at komme og tale til jer her i dag. Øh, jeg havde lige en diskussion med her før, om jeg skulle tale dansk eller jeg skulle tale engelsk. Så det nemmeste spørgsmål, det er... Øh, does somebody require English and do, does that understand Danish? I can... We have two people, three people. Um, er, der, er der nogen her, der ikke kan forstå engelsk, eller som, vil, som har svært ved, hvis det foregår på engelsk? Okay. I'll speak English, but the slides are in English, so <clears throat> sorry for um, So I'll repeat what I said before. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for this occasion, this possibility to talk to you today. Um, my name is Christian Hübler, as also Shilin said. I come from the University of Southern Denmark in Odense, uh, and I'm from the Center for Medieval Literature, or so it's called. And also, as she been told, my background is primarily in, in Greek, <coughs> that is ancient and medieval Greek, and Latin to some extent. And then I know some Arabic, and I've been working on the exchanges, the um, translations, you could say, back and forth between uh, Greek and Arabic, and among those, a early translation of the Quran. I'm in, in some conversation with some music outside, so I'll, uh, I'll try to make it. Greek music, you know. Greek music, could be Greek music. I'll pretend that I haven't heard it uh, to keep my mind close to what I'm, we'll go, I'm going to speak about. I'll speak about this, uh, we could call it a philosophical novel, which is perhaps something we know of today quite commonly. So a novel that is some kind of fictional universe that is then driven by a a wish to speak about philosophy. That's normal today, perhaps. Well, at least we have one of that kind from the Middle Ages, uh, written in Arabic in, well, either southern Spain, in Spain or in Morocco. We don't know exactly what it was written. Um, and from this tradition that we would call either Arabic philosophy or Islamic philosophy. And those two categories are almost overlapping because many people who wrote in Arabic were Muslims But then there was also philosophy written by Christians, by Jews especially. So that could be, if we say Arabic philosophy, it would include them. If we say Islamic philosophy, it would be that written in, uh, in Arabic and in Persian, actually, <coughs> but less in Persian. So Arabic was the big language of the Middle Ages in an enormous area, and everybody wanted to write Arabic because then you have thousands or millions of readers, perhaps. So this one, One novel has come out of the Arabic tradition, and that is by, well, not really by chance, but that is the one full text you can read, well now <laughs> promoting a Danish book, but well, you can read in English of course also, but it has been translated into Danish uh, more than 10 years ago by Henrik Kaufmann Sørensen, and then uh, later um, published by Ben Kurtzen, and I was part of the publication, so I'm It's partly in it, but it's Henry Kaufmann Sørensen who has produced this translation. It's a very lovely translation, and it's the one book that you can then read fully in Danish translation, and it's good. Uh, I don't, well, I'll show you why. Uh, and it is, um, <clears throat> well, then just one text out of thousands of texts that were written in Arabic concerning what we could call philosophy, and philosophy, by philosophy we mean, I think, more when we talk about old time, the ancient world and medieval time, It includes more than we would normally call philosophy today. It includes all the natural science, sciences, so physics and astronomy, even medicine, logic, math, math, mathematics, and so on. All that is philosophy to the, these people. <coughs> and also theology, actually. So, of course, there were theologians and there were philosophers. 
So they overlapped. There was a big overlap in interests or in things they talked about. And this philosophical novel is somehow trying to bridge it all. You'll hear soon that it sort of takes us through all the um, all the various uh, aspects of what philosopher was at that point. We don't really have any philosophical novels from all the other languages. Like we can't really make a parallel. Uh, we can only show that in later times, of course, we have also philosophical novels. So, if you couldn't read, you could perhaps see the image now there of the Danish translation. And here's Ibn Tufail. That's the author. He was born around 1105 in southern Spain. And he had another famous philosopher as a teacher, Ibn Bajat. Uh, he wrote on philosophy, astronomy, medicine. Th those philosophers were always writing about just about anything that was in philosophy. He was a doctor, he was a physician, so he treated the, this caliph, uh, Abu Yaqub Yusuf, and probably many other people at the court in Morocco. Uh, and he also recommended the quite famous uh, philosopher from this tradition, Imrushd, the guy who's known as Averroes in the Western Latin tradition. Well, and he died 1185 in Morocco. We don't know when he wrote this book, but he wrote it, of course, sometime in his active period. And <clears throat> it is called Hai Ibn Yakzan, or Yakzan, that is the protagonist of the story. That's his name, it's his funny name, it means life, son of the awakened, or something like that. So there's a kind of metaphorical or, or allegorical meaning in that name itself. And then it has this funny subtitle, or second part of the title, let me see how is that in English. That's the uh, the secrets of the Eastern wisdom. Well, that sounds really fascinating, doesn't it? Well, <clears throat> and this name Hay Ibn Yaqdan was actually taken from an earlier philosopher, Ibn Sina, also one of the big ones in that tradition, Avicenna, as he's called in, in the Latin Western tradition. He had also written some allegorical tales about a person of that name. So, Ibn Tufayla had at least sort of been inspired in that way. But that was short stories, you could say, and this is a novel. <clears throat> so what is it, what, what's it about, this novel? Well, I would say that its main theme, but there are lots of themes, and I'll return to that question. Its main theme is the question of how do we know anything at all? What is knowledge? What is, <clears throat> sort of, what can we be quite sure about or completely sure about? Well, that's always hard to say, isn't it? And philosophy is all about that that is somehow trying to say, well, at least we know this. Or if we don't know this, we know we could know this if we could, were able to follow the rules, you know, logics and so on, of uh, uh, that philosophy has developed. So that's the main idea. But the story is a story. So what is the story about? Well, I'm sorry again, or if you can't follow my English, then you can read Danish. You could say the story, the novel is in three parts. Those are the three, three parts I've mentioned here. First, there's an introduction where he's, where I mean, to find writes about philosophy, about the philosophers, what have they said, what, what's the sort of main uh, important things about this. Well, that's a big and uh, quite complicated introduction. That then results in when he sort of starts the story saying, well, there was this guy who was well, born or at least appeared on this island south of India, and well, we're out in a sort of kind of fairy tale context. And this guy, hi, that's our main protagonist, he appeared. Well, there are two versions. Well, either he was um, sent out by a woman who had had become pregnant and didn't want, uh, was afraid about showing the child. So, you know, like Moses and so on, put it out, him out in, in a small uh, thing and uh, let him sail off. And then he arrived at this island. That's one version. The other version is that he was somehow created naturally from in the ground with uh, clay and other substances down there making him appear somehow be, yeah, well, it's a complicated uh, description. And then at some point, suddenly he burst out and was, was spawned out of the earth, you could say. Well, in any case, those are the two versions, he says, that uh, exist of this person's birth. Well, then comes the next section, which is more sort of straightforward. It's the, his, how this high, uh, so grows up and gradually becomes aware of his surroundings and the world, you can see, all of it. 
And that is really a sort of a, a, a stepwise description. First he's young, then he's a bit older, and I'll come back very soon to, to the various steps. But the idea is that, of course, he's all on his own, so the only way he survives is that a gazelle, or some animal at that time, I'm not quite sure which it is, a gazelle would say, so uh, uh, in jort, in Danish, right, uh, takes care of him, feeds him, um, protects him from you know, dangerous animals and so on. So he's protected, and then, well, he reaches a, a stage where he can take care of himself. And at that point, this gazelle dies, and then he goes on on his own and gradually becomes aware of, well, the world on his own. So you could say this is a sort of a natural knowledge he acquires. He's not taught by anybody, nobody tells him anything. <clears throat> and he reaches a certain age, maturity, and he becomes aware even of um, celestial and uh, divine knowledge. And then we reach the, sec the third part, which is that suddenly, and if you read Robinson Crusoe, you would say, oh, I got that story. Suddenly one day, there's a guy come, who comes to the island, and they meet. And who's this guy? He's called Absal. He's not called Friday. He's called Absal. He comes to the island, and uh, he is, um, he has, he's been running away from his society. He's fed up with his society. They're uh, just always fighting and all this. He wants to find a place of calmness, of, uh, sort of where he can think about things and try to reach some kind of um, makes you an idea about well, the world, right? So he comes to this island, which he thinks is, is uninhabited. So he's surprised when he sees this guy, uh, Hai, who has been living there. And Hai is very surprised because he's never seen an, a, another person before. But he sort of recognizes, okay, okay, two legs, and yeah, yeah, okay, you're the same kind as me. Uh, I had, until now, sort of thought I was the only one. So these two guys meet, and then there's a very interesting, I think is very important thing that, uh, that uh, Intifai then includes on the, in this meeting, is that then Absal tells, uh, teaches him the language, right? He couldn't speak. So he had reached all these knowledge that we'd heard of before without having any language. So that's perhaps, I think, Intifai's way of saying, this is really a natural knowledge. It's done even without language. I don't know how, but the story is, of course, told in language, but, but I had no language. Okay, so the two guys then ha start having a conversation, and then uh, Absal, the newcomer, finds out that this high actually has all the knowledge he wanted, and he has the solution to all these problems he was running away from in his society. So he says, okay, why don't you come with me? We go back to my place, and then you tell all these other crazy people what, what you what the, 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 the sort of what you the, the knowledge you've reached and, and then everything will be settled. Yeah, okay, okay. So they go back to this society which is not really so you can't really tell where it is, but it's normal life in those times. They go back to this to city and Hai starts telling people his knowledge and some people, yeah, okay. Mm. And then soon no no they disagree on that even and it becomes even worse the uh, sort of conflict arises from this uh, you could say attempt to <coughs> preach or, or disseminate uh, real knowledge, and the end. It's a spoiler. I'm sorry. I'll tell you. Uh, but uh, the end is that they find out the only way to to sort of live with this knowledge is to go back to the island. Oh. Sad, sad ending in a sense. Well, but this is clearly a novel. It, it, it is a story about even more than one person. It is a uh, growing up. It's 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 a story of of growing up, of reaching maturity, a common theme in modern uh, novels, not a common theme in ancient or medieval mo mo uh, novels, that wasn't the case. Normally, normally the novels were like stories either of fighting or of love, and in either cases, in either case you would not tell the story of a sort of childhood. No, no, come we start when they are sort of at some point of maturity, and, and that's when they either fall in love or start fighting with somebody else. <clears throat> so this is there's a very modern touch in this sense to this novel. Now, <clears throat> this whole story about uh, philosophy being something that is can be exchanged, is discussed, is presented as something that is of a deep knowledge and has an impression that think, makes you think, okay, here is something I can learn from, is of course very much part of this tradition which we would call Arabic or Islamic philosophy, which is very much dedicated to the idea of uh, 
of an ancient tradition coming mainly from the tradition we know as Greek philosophy. So this is why Socrates and some of Socrates' uh, sort of followers are depicted on this in this Arabic manuscript because lots of the Arabic philosophy were Plato, Aristotle, and other people translated into Arabic, very often through other languages, especially Syriac. But so a large part of the Arabic philosophy, Islamic philosophy, was Plato, and Aristotle, and so on, other philosophers in translation, and then came all of work done by Arabic philosophers. By the common saying is uh, you know, uh, giving you presentations of what was mean, the meaning of the ancient philosophy and then giving you ideas, new, uh, new thoughts, uh, so sort of putting new thoughts into writing, just like the novel we're talking about here. So this whole idea about talking, here you have, this is, uh, <clears throat> The, the, the man on the left is Aristotle, and he, no, no, sorry, on the right is Aristotle, and he's speaking to a guy on the left in, 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 in military outfit, and that's because that's Alexander the Great. So you have this orientation towards uh, the Greek tradition, but also other ways. There were also there was also Indian philosophy, Persian philosophy, and other things that mixed in, and in Arabic, as uh, one I, I can really recommend this book, and Nadim al Farist, al Fikrist. The, the bookshopper's son uh, in Baghdad, end of the 10th century, he could look out on all this tradition, saying, you know, in Indian, there's writing this, in Greek, they wrote this, and so on. There was this uh, in the Arabic tradition, an, an enormous coverage of all traditions. But the Greek was very important. Now, this whole idea about talking to each other, having a philosophical discussion, is known in so many places in stories that were disseminated all over this enormous world, you could say, from Morocco to, uh, let's say, Afghanistan or something like that. In that area, a lot of uh, stories were disseminated, well, orally, of course, as well, always do, but also in writing. And one of them was, this is actually an image taken from the Khalil Abadimna, uh, which you may know as a very famous uh, Arabic, um, early Arabic uh, prose text, or text. Um, and this is the king and the philosopher uh, speaking to each other, the philosopher telling the story, the uppermost frame of that story. And then, of course, telling all these stories about animals. And I'm mentioning this because the, talk, the text I'm talking about, even to files and philosophical novel, has so much with animals. I mean, this thing that he's t taken care of by animals and he's that he looks at the other animals and finds out who he himself is because he's different. And you'll see also later this whole idea about uh, reaching, reaching some kind of uh, knowledge about himself is dependent on seeing that he's different from the animals. Yes? I read this uh, more than 30 years ago, and uh, after that when I read The uh, Animal Farm, <laughs> yeah. I thought that uh, George Orwell copied uh, Ibn Kaffa, who wrote this book. Yeah. Very, very interesting, because it was politics, but they didn't dare to use the names of the kings. No. But they use the animals. You know, yeah. Right, yeah, and you could say it is a way of, of uh, yeah. s making pseudonyms uh, for people, but it's also a way of telling of various characters. Yeah. Uh, and this whole thing about animal fables yeah. is yeah. so widespread. Yeah. And it's part, I think, of why a, such a philosophical novel yeah. could arise in, in the Arabic yeah. tradition. Well, this is in Danish, I'm afraid. I'll try to see if I can translate it into English. But this is just a text sample of the kind of um, experiences that Hay has in his very early part, in the early part of his life. So he sees that his his uh, the other gazelles that he's growing up with are different. They are not. They they suddenly suddenly they can run very fast. They get horns, and he doesn't. And he can't run very fast. And he. He's thinking, why, why is this? I mean, how come I'm different? Why am, am I not like the other animals? And he, he doesn't even look like those that are wounded or, or disfigured animals. So it's not sort of a miscarriage. It's not that. He's just different. So what, what, why is it? <clears throat> and then he looks at sort of the way that they, uh, who are, uh, how would I say that in, in, in English, sorry? Uh, uh, go to the toilet, right? Yeah. Uh, they're different again, yeah. and that his uh, um, genitals are visible in a way that it's not it's not visible on, in the other animals. So he's different. And the interesting thing is what it ends up with. It says, and he, he saw this, and it made him worry. He was sort of uh, sad that there was this difference. 
And I think there's a, the whole novel has this sort of tristesse somewhere hidden in it that is some kind of acknowledging that I, can, I can't just run, I can't just use my horns because I, I run slower, I, ha I have no horns, and so on. And, and so this lack is the beginning of, of trying to understand. And that is the, the way that the early part of his life is very much presented. It is a sort of a, an attempt to, to cover the, the lack that he sees. I think it's a very interesting point of actually why, why do we have philosophy. Right? So here we have this scheme which the novel then follows. And it's an old scheme. It's an idea about that, that mankind is, is constructed, <coughs> if you say naturally, by, by biology, the way that it's in seven years steps that we grow or we sort of change when we grow up. So the first seven years, the first seven years are just you know surviving, mm -hmm. and of course it's very dependent on others' help to survive. You can't uh, survive on your own, and so don't, uh, high is helped by this gazelle. But then, when reaching the age of seven, he then um, it says fourteen, but that is the end point. So um, the second period is from seven to fourteen. And there he starts acknowledging that he should cover himself up. That was also, as you saw before, the question about his genitals being invisible. So he, he dresses up. So what, what, what does he use? Well, he sees a dead eagle. It must be kind of big, I don't know. Uh, and he cuts it up. So put the, the, the wings and the arms and the front on the front part of his, of his body and the back part on the back of his body. And then his mother, you could say, also. The gazelle who takes care of him dies, which is of course a sad, very sad uh, scene and so on. But then he he is he is uh, he thinks he has to find out wh wh why why has he died has she died all of a sudden, and he wants to find out the cause because if he finds the cause then he may sort of uh, cure her. Mm -hmm. And though uh, well you can see he, she's, she she died of age, so there's no real sort of. She hasn't suffered any bruises or anything, so what can it be? And he cuts her up, it's kind of strange to see, but he cuts her up to find is there any reasons inside. And then at the end, he discovers the heart, which you think is a very sort of central place. And that is, he cuts up and finds that, that, uh, that it has sort of open spaces in there. And that's where the life spirit should have been, and it's gone now. So that is part of the beginning of an idea about what is life, um, which then goes through in other parts also. So I'll take you through this, not to, to bore you, I hope, but then the next stage is actually reaching maturity, so sexual or, or procreating maturity. That part is passed over. That is, in, I mean, in the normal scheme, which is, goes back into Greek philosophy. It would be on that, but this, that's not really handled in this text. Then comes when, after uh, he's 21, then comes the part where he he, he, he domesticates animals, the horse and the eagle, so he get, they can help him in, 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 in hunting. He finds out that animals are different, plants are different. He starts constructing categories. So the whole idea that there's some kind of system in that, that they are. And this whole idea about that, well, they are all part of life, but then under structures and so on. And it's directly taken out of, you could say, of Aristotelic um, discussions about categories. How do you, um, um, what do you call things, and how do you know that they're part of the same group, if they're different, they're different, yeah, but under a big group you have undergroups and so on. This whole idea, form and matter, such very abstract categories, again coming out of Aristotelian physics, is what he sort of discovers through observing. And this whole idea about observing is, again, Quite unique, you could say, it's that this is there's so much emphasis on this. Um, ancient and medieval philosophy were not, first of all, you could call it empiric philosophy, saying you would have to go out and look. No, no, <coughs> you first of all, have to think. Um, but here is very much so the idea that you have to go out and look. Well, the, the heavens is a sphere, and it must have a creator who is immaterial. So we reach a in the next step, we certainly reach an, another kind of, of, of knowledge, you could say. Then comes this, the period between 35 and 42, and that way, that's where you're meant to create a family. Well, there's no family here, of course. Uh, so not, no mention of that. But then the last step is that mankind is a special thing among the animals. And there's, I mean, there's simply a difference. 
um, and that there is a creator of all of this. And then there's a sort of a final stage of that, the, 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 the reaching the, the knowledge that there is a creator makes him think, how can I approach this creator? And then there are three steps of imitation. One very lovely scene of, of where he, he finds out the, the, these uh, spheres in, in, in the sky, the planets, you say. They, they have a sort of circular movement, so he starts making circular movements himself dancing, you could say, on the ground, and uh, thinking, okay, I'm, I'm trying to imitate this and trying to find out what this is, this, um, uh, the divine, and in the end, reaching, one must say, it's short, it's short description, but the, the imitation of the mystic, the, the unification, the, the unio mystica, uh, so reaching a, 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 a unified state with the divine. Okay. So this is all the middle part is made, sort of boiled down to its structure. And as I showed you the quotation before, and it's sort of the, it shows the kind of narrative that it has. It's, 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 it's a long description of all these steps. You have uh, a when does MP5 uh, meet the, the, the other guy? He's, it's my age, you can say, when he meets this other guy. But in a sense, it's described as, as if they were younger, in a sense. It's, 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 but it, I mean, perhaps you could say there's hardly, there's not much realism in that sense, but it's after that. This is the second part. There was the first part, which sort of philosophical introduction with the question of the two kinds of birth. Then comes this whole section, the second part. And then there's the last part, which is meeting Absal, going to his place and returning to the island. So what is this book about? You could say, I put it as the first, it's, it's, it's a critique of, of society, uh, because the whole story about Absal seems to say there's something wrong in society and there's a sort of a real, uh, a better way of doing it, but, but they're all doing it in the wrong way. So somehow there's, uh, uh, there is that element, but it's of course put in a very allegorical way, so there's no, it's sort of, nobody's pointed out, it's not any specific city or rule or anything, but sort of in general, people have constructed their societies well. There's some kind of notion of that. But the natural, so the, the, this, the, the quest for a natural knowledge that is very deep embedded in this, the whole idea that you, that it, it, even if, um, if man was left up to his own, he would probably reach a better and safer knowledge than now we're discussing, which is in a sense uh, a funny idea. But there is at least the idea that you could reach a complete knowledge uh, at least if, if things happen as with high. So in the Western tradition, and also in, in lots of later discussion, but I'm taking these two because they come up in, because this text was then in the 16th, 17th century translated into Latin and then become part of other discussions. Um, but then there was this whole thing about the autodidact, the question of that you can actually learn on your own. Is that possible and so on? discussions of that, or tabula rasa, which means blank slate, like, uh, so the idea that when you're born, there's no, there's no knowledge, but you can actually get knowledge all the way through, uh, um, and in a sense, copy what I did. But the whole question is also, what is knowledge? Because the high seems to reproduce, to a very large extent, known knowledge. I mean, the Aristotelian system does <laughs> come up as a as, as something that then apparently has a, a real fundamental trueness in it. Um, and, and you could say this is perhaps something we also look at, because in the old world, philosophy was quite sure about itself, that these, this traditional way of discussing things were actually um, a good basis. That's a, I mean, there were, there were these people who didn't want philosophy, but, but in general there was a, 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 a confidence in that kind. And you could say modern philosophy has, has to some extent, lost that confidence. Uh, this text has no idea about, uh, you know, uh, perhaps there's a knowledge somewhere outside uh, the, the kind of philosophy we're, we're talking about. And then, of course, there's a question of what this title is about, as I also uh, said earlier, uh, the, the secrets of Eastern wisdom. Um, and that has led to a strange discussion because um, this clearly refers somehow to Ibn Sina and to the, the guy, the philosopher from where Ibn Tufal took the name of Hai. And Ibn Sina was living in Khorasan and was born out there way east. 
which is not the way that I think some early Western uh, scholars looked at it. They thought East that sounds exotic, and secrets that sounds even more exotic. So they thought there was some kind of secret, uh, um, well, um, what do you call it? System behind it. Some kind of hidden, uh, um, or even esoteric knowledge, right? Mysticism or something. Like that. Okay, so they invented the whole story about that, and made even even Sina into some sort of mystic in 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 the sense that this guy represented uh, this. And there's simply no, nothing about it. It's this, this, it, it is a reference to, to the East, where Ibn Sina was. That's why East. And secrets is because uh, I'm giving you something you would want to know. It's, it's good to know. Come, read it. So th there's, th this second title should not be read as some kind of esoteric or, 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 or difficult um, question about the truthness of what we actually read, I think. So that's the question of the title. I've, I've talked a bit about, and, and, and I'm not going to talk, take you through the whole question of, 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 of Arabic or, or Islamic philosophy, but I've talked now about both the Greek tradition before and Western tradition, but also other traditions later that take these texts <coughs> into account. And I think that perhaps is one of the most important things about uh, this kind of philosophy is that it has had an enormous outreach and there's enormous contact, uh, phases of contact between these traditions and it's part of the modern discussion also about what Arabic philosophy is or Islamic philosophy is and it's, um, it's also I think what one should emphasize when saying that there's a complete disregard or the, the amount of disregard for Arabic philosophy or Islamic philosophy is it, it, simply uh, Unaccounted for, you could, or it's put it in another way, it's, it, it's wrong. It's very commonly not included into big um, histories of philosophy. Uh, there was a book come, came out 10, 15 years ago in Denmark, which is called, uh, uh, how, now I'm losing my Danish. Mm. Um, well, in any case, it was, it was called Western thinking, and included medieval stuff, of course, but, but no. Islamic philosopher appeared apart from in small footnotes and so on. And I, and I thought, well, if, if you want Western, then go to Spain, that's the westernmost part of, of Europe, and, and, and there are lots of philosophers down there. You can't call this Western philosophy if you're not included. I'm just putting one example of the, uh, the, the lack of interest in this from a purely, you could say, cultural um, discrimination uh, uh, aspect. So to try to sort of show, this is an attempt to show <clears throat> just where the important phases of contact between these uh, traditions were. It's complicated, it's, it's, it's a map and it's, it, it, it doesn't tell you exactly how to read it. But the thing is there was a Greek philosophy and when we go back long enough into ancient times, uh, we only really know of Greek philosophy and then some, perhaps something we could call Chinese and Indian philosophy and we can hardly, it's very hard to indicate any kind of direct link. There are attempts, but it's, it's hard to, to indicate exactly. But the Greek philosophy started to become, and you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle and so on, started to be translated. And one of the very important translation uh, processes were from Greek into a language called Syriac. It's, you may know that it is also to some extent spoken today, also in Syria. But it's, it was the big language of the Levant of uh, Syria, Palestine, that language you could say, in ancient times. So it was translated into Syria, lots of philosophy. <coughs> and at the same time, or overlapping at least to some degree in the same area, and then I've drawn a big circle, and that circle should probably be a bit bigger, but mainly still in what is today is, uh, Syria and Iraq. There was this enormous translation movement from Arabic, from so from Greek or from Syriac into Arabic. So we we place the the the, the most important two centuries were from around 800 till one, year 1000, where all that was known in Greek or in Syria was translated into Arabic. And, and I can actually quite safely say everything that was known. Because we know of lots of 
works that were translated or even two and three times. So there was an enormous interest in this Greek philosophy and everything that was available was translated into um, Arabic. And that tradition became enormously influential and of course a hundred year years later after what, you were 1000 then or a bit more Ibn Tufayl, among others, could then read Plato, Aristotle, and all these guys in translations in Arabic. Now, another translation movement that then took place was not that long <coughs> after, starting around 1100, and especially then again, two following centuries, from Arabic into Latin. And that has, um, whereas the others, you could say, uh, have been less controversial, this translation movement has attracted some kind of interest these last decades and so on from I would call an even polemical uh, um, um, attitude. It, it has been being discussed to what extent Arabic philosophy or Islamic philosophy, however you want to phrase it, influenced the West, Western traditions. And I mean there's only, I would say, from a basic point of view, if you want to say, does, is there influence this way from this tradition or this author or this philosopher to that other one, well, did this other one read the first one? That's the sort of most commonly known way to indicate whether there's an influence or not. And they read these translations to an enormous extent. The tradition that we know as the scholastic tradition was completely dependent upon these translations from Arabic into Latin. Not saying that there was nothing in Latin before that, because there have been translations into Latin directly from Greek earlier on, so there was a knowledge already about the traditions so on, but it was a very small, restricted amount of translations, and then suddenly in these centuries came a sort of full translation of what was known from the Greek, um, what the Arabic tradition had from the Greek, and a lot a lot of texts that were produced in Arabic. All this was translated into Latin, and when scholastic philosophers <coughs> quoted Aristotle, for example, they would say the philosopher, and when they searched, then searched the commentators, the, those that could help them understand what Aristotle actually meant, they would very often quote, uh, for example, Averroes, mm -hmm. calling him the commentator. So, I mean, as, as just a completely uh, obvious point of reference, the commentator says so and so. So there was an influence. I mean, the, 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 it's very strange to see, and, and that's where uh, sometimes in my field, when I talk about other things that I, I work on, you don't see the variety of opinions that you see in such politically um, um, tense issues. There suddenly you have people who have actually, and that's what I, I most wonder about how, how that can happen, who have the knowledge, they know all about these things, they even know the languages and so on, they can read the thing, but they have opinions that I, can, I can't recognize uh, sort of as, 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 as representing the state of things. I don't see that in other fields, I see where the political influence make some people take, you know, very you know, polemicized, I would call it, or these very specialized <laughs> Views, and then you also see the other, uh, and the, it has been a common thing. I know when we're talking about this to people generally, that it's commonly said, at least in Denmark, you would hear people say, "Yeah, yeah, those were the centuries when everything was learned from the Arabs, wasn't it?" And I say, "No, oh, no, come on, you didn't learn everything, but you learned a lot." And 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 so, of course, we have to discuss exactly what. But there's no, there's no, well, you can take my word, but I you can also try to go through the whole stuff yourself. I would say there's no way to claim that this has had no influence. Then of course, as you can see I've put up here, at a later point, and I, I, should, I should back date that, it's not 1400, it's actually the end of the 13th century, then started a, a, a translation from, directly from Greek into Latin, of the ancient philosophers and such. In any case, this just shows that this philosophical literature, which is not easy to read, that is, of course, apart from this one, which I recommend, mm -hmm. it's easy to read, uh, not the introduction, but then when the story starts, it's very easy to read, and it's nice. Other types of philosophy are very technical, very systematic, you know, you get bored half, into half a page, and so on. Um, 
and, and not nice things in between. But it's hard. It's, it's, it's a field that you need requires study and systematization and all this stuff. And ne nevertheless, it became so popular. It became so spread. And the, ch the movement of these texts back and forth between various languages and various parts of the world is impressive when looking at this age where hardly anything was translated or, 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 or taken from one area of the world to another. And just to show you, because there were other types of texts that were translated, as I also showed in, I've been um, studying this early story of, of, of an early trans translation into Greek of the Quran. But uh, there were other texts that became immensely popular. And for example, you can take a Kalila al which I, which is this lovely <coughs> animal fable story, frame story, with lots of stories in stories and so on. That text is actually mainly an original Indian text, the Panchatantra, that was then translated to Persian in the 6th century, and then became translated to Syriac, but also into Arabic, and Ibn al Mukaffa is a sort of big hero of, of Arabic literature. But that again became translated into Greek in various versions, into Castilian, Spanish you could say, into Hebrew, and then again became translated into other versions. And actually, they so the Kalila Vodimna in not really the Middle Ages, but early modern time, existed in Italian Spanish versions, of course, with a lot of changes and so on, which happens when you translate a text. But that's just to show that there were certain types of text that had an enormous uh, appeal and were translated. So you could have a, an Indian text arriving in, in Spain as it takes some centuries, right? But it would uh, transgress. And that is also what happened uh, to Arabic philosophy. So if you want to read about Arabic philosophy or Islamic philosophy, I can re recommend these two books. Um, and it also, because it's, it, to, to us, it's to extent deal with what I'm talking about. So they're both written by Dimitri Gutas, who's an expert on all this. And this book is, first of all, the one book that really tells the story of the translation movement. These two centuries was an enormous activity about, and about the question about who they were, these translators. <laughs> Who, who was interested in all this? Why were they translated? And so on. Uh, there is also a Cambridge Companion to Arabic philosophy. But that text, when reading it, you discover that there's, um, this is difficult. And why is it so difficult to read about? When I read a book about Plato or Aristotle, I can sort of open a, a, an introduction and say, oh, OK, OK, Plato thought so and so, and uh, he lived in this time and so on. When I read this companion to Arabic philosophy, I'm very soon lost in, in, in chapters saying, OK, I'm not sure I know more what we're talking about, or this is very specialized, and so on. There's a lack of, sort of, of producing simple introductions to this. It's, 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 a, it's like fields that have only a short life and other fields that have a long life, things that have sort of not been dealt with in this kind of way to present things um, uh, well, to a common public or to, or to children and so on, uh, have not reached that kind of presentation that others have. I'm just talking about how things are made available to a general audience. That is all, all a, it's a talk I, I come with as an introduction. It's actually a, an advertisement, this, because I'm sad uh, sitting there, there at the end, and I are producing a book which we hope very much will appear next year in Danish, so I should not sense be speaking Danish to you right now, on Arabic philosophy, um, which is a book for the Danish high school, gymnasium. That I, I think, or we think, is needed. We think that it is important that these things are made available in a common sense way. Simply, instead of saying either the Arabs taught us, taught us or taught the West everything, or saying the Arabs uh, have had no influence and so on, then simply tell, tell the story. Say what, who were these philosophers? What did they deal with? So we talk about ethics, politics, and and so on, theology, <coughs> theology, and mystics, and so on, but also. Uh, technique and um, uh, construction of machines and so on. And simply telling the story, what was it? Who were they? What was the interesting point in it? How can we 
discuss and think about it today. So I hope you found this interesting and I'm really keen to hear questions and I have also a, uh, an email address so you can send me questions afterwards if you don't feel like asking me now. Please contact us or me at any point uh, for information or, or, or wish to um, even to be perhaps part readers of this uh, text that we are, are trying to produce. It's very difficult to find the kind of right language, so we're interested also in finding people who would want to read it at an early stage. Um, this is part of my work as a person dealing with literature, and that's of course perhaps less philosophical, it sounds less, less philosophical than what I've been talking about here. But I think it's a very important part of what we could call li literature, or just simply how people think and how they exchange thoughts. Um, and um, I hope I've also done this. Thank you very much. <laughs>